Okay, um, I'm going to try and give a shortened version as much as possible of the lecture that you guys are going to miss uh, because of PSATs. I'll try and be as quick as possible. Uh, the first thing I want to cover is um, the direct from the AP, the sorts of things that they want us to know about uh, the Enlightenment. So we'll go forward with that first. Um, first of all, some themes of the Enlightenment. Keep in mind that the goal of the Enlightenment was progress. That's what these philosophes were seeking, is to bring humanity uh, towards a, a better life, a better um, existence, a more peaceful existence, a more organized existence, progress. And so they considered the best methods to achieve progress uh, were reason, which we've just discussed, science, liberty, and toleration. They considered these, in general, they considered these to be the goals. Reason, science, liberty, and toleration. I suggest writing those down because we're going to compare what we learn about the philosophes with these ideas. Sometimes they are going to practice what they preach, if you will, and sometimes they are not. So we want, in order to get those complexity points on the uh, test, you want to be able to show, okay, here's some examples where they did what they said, or showed that they believe what they said, sometimes not so much. So here we go. Other things that you read about uh, for homework, new public venues and print media popularized Enlightenment ideas. The AP wants to make sure you understand this, that these new public venues are bringing uh, these Enlightenment ideas out to the public. Some places, the textbook talked about uh, Salon in Paris, but there were also coffee houses in London that you can use as examples of places where people could come together in public and exchange ideas. Coffee houses in London, although those were exclusively, generally exclusively, only allowed for men. Now, despite censorship, there were increasing and numerous very printed materials um, and these were used by a wider and wider public. Public is becoming more and more literate, and the more literate the public becomes, the more ideas are able to be spread. And we have this development of what is called public opinion. Public opinion is something that can now be malleable if you get enough printed material out into the public. Pu uh, public opinion was swayed by printed material to the point of us getting an American Revolution, to the point of us having a French Revolution. Public opinion was very much swayed by the use of printed material, such as newspapers, periodicals, these things are on the rise. Books, of course, which have been around for a while, but printing is becoming more, less and less expensive. Pamphlets, this was a major tool of, of the Enlightenment and, and ultimately of the resulting revolutions that come out of the Enlightenment. Uh, and then also you read about the Encyclopedia Encyclopédie of Diderot, and we'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, so Enlightenment thought focused on the concepts such as empiricism. Now go back to that list that you should have written down of reason, science, liberty, toleration. I want you to go through empiricism. Which one of these? Uh, well, you could fall into the category of science, right? Empiricism is about observation. Uh, skepticism is also a part of the scientific process, assuming that um, your previous knowledge is incorrect, and that you use observation to uh, find out, or even conclusions you've made before, assuming that they could be wrong, and t testing again, that's in the scientific method. Now, skepticism, you could put in the category of reason, although skepticism can be a very emotional thing as well. So you can put, uh, skepticism probably fits best under the science category, although, again, it is it can be an emotional thing, so we try and avoid the emotions of, in science as much as possible, although it's impossible completely. Uh, human reason, obviously that connects on your list of reason. Rationalism, uh, which does this connect to on your list? And then classical sources, which doesn't connect to your list, although they did use classical sources. And that one is more tradition, which is what the Enlightenment is trying to get away from. So we're not seeing a, a, a dependence on class, classical sources as we had before. Um, and again, the Enlightenment is about challenging the prevailing patterns of thought with respect to social order, institutions of government, and the role of faith. And we'll get into that into more depth later. Um, let's, again, trying to challenge social norms. This is the goal of the Enlightenment philosophe. Um, 
And these philosophes are also challenging absolutism and mercantilism, and we'll get into that into our discussion in a moment, too. Uh, now, John Locke, uh, this is someone who um, predates the Enlightenment period, or what we call the Enlightenment period. When we study John Locke, as you can check in your notes, when we studied Hobbes and Locke, both of whom believed in the social contract theory, but um, Hobbes obviously believed that we can't take that contract back. Locke did and that those theories really stimulated Enlightenment thought. They considered Locke to be someone uh, admired, and his writings to be something to be admired. Um, and furthermore, um, Locke points out to the fact that human beings are driven by self-interest, and therefore we need to use those, those drives in our discussion of how governments should be, um, should be run. And that ultimately the state originated from the consent of the people, and therefore um, the people should have the right to, to, to make decisions about that government if that government uh, interferes with their natural rights. Uh, again, we'll talk about mercantilism in a little while. Uh, in fact, we probably won't talk to, about it until next class because we didn't have time. Uh, make sure that you check in your textbook about physiocrats. The AP specifically wants you to know about the physiocrats and know the example of Francois Quenet. Uh, we didn't have time to talk about him in depth in class, but it is something the AP specifically says you need to have an example of. So you can find that on page 507 in your textbook. Um, also, trying to be rational about religious practices, although humans tend to have a difficult time. You either have a really negative feeling of religious practices or really positive feeling. It's hard for us to be unemotional about religious practices, but during the Enlightenment they're at least attempting uh, a more rational analysis of religion. Um, although you can read, again, look at your list, reason, science, li liberty, toleration. You can find a, a, a rather um, intolerant attitude towards religious practices from some uh, Enlightenment philosophers, which kind of are very similar to the intolerance of the church at the time. So. Um, Again, if you read carefully in your textbook, you can get some of those uh, nuances. But again, we'll get into more detail in a moment. Uh, ultimately, what comes out of this Enlightenment period is that religion becomes more and more viewed as a private rather than a public concern, to the point that by the time we get to the end of the 18th century, um, religious toleration is something that becomes fairly common uh, across Europe. By 1800, most governments in Western and Central Europe had extended toleration to Christian minorities and in some states, civil equality to Jews, even. Um, again, this is by the end of the Enlightenment, you have more religious toleration as a result. Um, however, uh, even though the we have to keep in mind, and we will we'll get into this a little bit more in depth in a moment, we have to keep in mind that these intellectuals, these philosophes, such as Rousseau, uh, did not extend their concept, look at your list of four, again, reason, science, liberty, toleration. They weren't very interested in the liberty of women or the liberty of um, certain groups of people who were different, uh, such as slaves. This didn't really interest them that much. So we have to keep in mind that they still are um, connected to traditional values. They still believe in their traditional values of male privilege. And so their, their um, rationalism only takes them so far. They, are, they don't find themselves able to look at their own personal lives, their family lives, their home lives, as rationally as they project that uh, rationalism out at other people. So let's get more in depth now with specific Philosoph. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so here we go. The, the philosoph. Uh, obviously, philosoph is just a fancy French word for um, philosopher. It's not a misspelling. It's a French word for philosopher. We use the word philosophe to sh on an essay to show that you're just more sophisticated, that you realize that the early um, Enlightenment philosophers were, in fact, French. Uh, these, oh, sorry, we'll get to that thing in a second. Uh, the early Enlightenment philosophers were 
French. And so that's why we use this word philosophe uh, to show that we're talking about specifically Enlightenment philosophers. Um, now, who's who in the Enlightenment? Again, these guys, Newton and Locke, these are not considered enlightened. Enlightenment thinkers, they are the people who are celebrated by the Enlightenment thinkers, by the philosophes. Um, Newton, of course, for his laws of, um, of motion and his scientific method. He comes up with this method that we've talked about in previous classes, and then Locke, based on what uh, we just, just mentioned earlier about being able to um, look at a government that is no longer serving the people and re take away our social contract with that government and replace them with a government that will guarantee our natural rights of life, liberty, and property. And so Newton's laws of physics are a rational view of the universe. Those of you who understand physics very well realize that, that Newton's idea of physics was very orderly and very uh, simple and organized. However, if you study physics in depth, which I have not, but my understanding is it gets a lot less rational now that we have a more modern view of, of things that, that don't necessarily, uh, aren't as predictable as Newton's um, philosophy. Uh, nevertheless, Newton's physics are the easiest thing for us to understand in a, in a, in a um, step one in the road to understanding the physical world. And so therefore, the philosopher at the time believed the earth, the earth to be um, very predictable. Um, and therefore, they wanted to connect that concept of predictability to the rest of the world, including the social realm and the political realm. Um, Locke, Locke was in favor of religious toleration. Look at your list of four, reason, science, liberty, toleration. That's going to ring with the, uh, the philosoph of the time and a rational view of government, meaning if the government is not serving you, you need to take uh, reform the government. So your early philosophes, Voltaire, Diderot, Montesquieu, Rousseau, these are all French philosophes. Then later we, uh, then we also have Prussian uh, philosophe Kant and the Scottish Adam Smith. And we'll talk about his economics next class. And then of course the, the philosophes from the United States, Jefferson, Franklin, Payne, we won't have time to talk about those today. So Voltaire, French philosopher, philosophe, excuse me, author and playwright. He's best known for Candide. In fact, even when I had to read Voltaire in graduate school, instead of one of his denser, deeper um, texts, we were required simply to read Candide because it's the easiest and most entertaining way of getting his big ideas. Um, although he probably would not be too happy with the fact that that is the thing he's best known for. It's a very, it's very, it's simple-minded. Yet it gets his message across. Um, other works that are much more sophisticated in nature, uh, his letters on England, when he gets uh, exiled from France, he goes to England and writes wonderful letters about how wonderfully the English government works, where they have English under the control, English monarchy under the control of a constitution, and they have much more religious freedom. Keep in mind, in France at the time, there is no religious freedom. The king determines that the Catholic Church is, in fact, the state religion, and there is no room for minority. You know, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, that is the, in, the environment that he's writing in. There's no religious freedom, really, in France. And so he's writing about the, how religious freedom in England works so well for the English. Um, and then there is this ph philosophical dictionary, which is kind of a precursor to the encyclopedia. He writes the same sorts of things uh, that you will find in Diderot's encyclopedia, only it's not as uh, a large a work. Uh, the encyclopédie is, is massive. Uh, this is a single volume of work. And then finally we get to the elements of Newton's philosophy which um, what Voltaire is doing, he wasn't a big scientist. He was more of a polit you know, political uh, philosopher. But he does this thing, he does the Bill Nye the Science Guy thing. He popularizes um, the ideas of Newton, and as do other philosophers in his day, and that's one of the big things of the Enlightenment. All of a sudden, 
um, these big scientists, scientific ideas that have come up during the scientific revolution are now being explained in ways that the popular public the public can understand. And Voltaire is an example you could give in an essay of that. He writes this book called Elements of Newton's Philosophy, but get this, he didn't understand Newton's philosophy. He had to get together with his lover um, to explain it to him. This woman, um, uh, in this, well, she's in a state of undress right here, but she's holding this mirror and she is reflecting the the genius of Newton in a way that Voltaire, this is Voltaire down here, Voltaire can understand. She's explaining Newton, here's Newton up in, up in heaven because he's so wonderful, he's in heaven, he had great ideas. She's reflecting this brilliance onto Voltaire, her lover. This is Emilie du Châtelet. She's a French mathematician, physicist, and author. She was also a noble woman. Uh, her husband didn't mind that she uh, fooled around with Voltaire, and in fact, he used to go ride horses with Voltaire, her husband. She spent most of her time with uh, Voltaire, and um, she explained the intricacies. She explained the intricacies of uh, Newton's philosophy, Newton's findings to Voltaire, so that Voltaire could explain it to a, a wider audience, people who were not physicists like Emilie du Châtelet. So here is an example um, that you can use on an essay of the role of women at this time. In fact, Voltaire says of her, a great man who, uh, whose only fault was being a woman. This is how what he says about her. And in other words, if she had been a man and she had accomplished all that she had accomplished, she would be considered by the public to be a great man the way Voltaire was at the time. But she was a woman, and so she's not getting any, any play, if you will. She's not getting the traction. She's not getting the publicity. She's not getting the respect that she would otherwise get if she were a man. So she has the intellect of a man, and in fact, she's smarter than Voltaire, as he, he admits. In, in the writing of this book, uh, and yet uh, she doesn't get any of, I mean, who's heard of, everyone's heard of Voltaire, who's heard of Emilie du Châtelet? Very few people. And so here is another example of the role of women and the plight of women at the time of the Enlightenment. Um, this is not a time of women's liberation, uh, this Enlightenment. M men are in, being coming enlightened about their own rights and their own freedoms, but not so much about the freedoms of women. Uh, so she's his muse, and in fact is devastated when she passes away, I believe in childbirth. Okay, um, he advocates, uh, Voltaire uh, advocates religious toleration, uh, and the older he gets, the crankier he gets about uh, <laughs> the church. He's a great critic of, of Christianity and every, any kind of religion that's called a revealed religion. In other words, any religion where people claim to have been given direct information from God. For example, in, in, uh, um, in, in Judaism, the Ten Commandments are said to come from God. In Christianity, um, Jesus claims to be uh, the son of God. Uh, in, in Islam, uh, the prophet Muhammad claims to have received his message from an angel. Uh, Voltaire is against that kind of concept of revealed religion. He, however, is not an atheist, uh, not at all. He is a deist, which I think your textbook calls clockmaker god. I think I accidentally said watchmaker god to the other students, but uh, either way it would work fine on an essay. Uh, clockmaker God. In other words, God wound us up. He created, he did the Big Bang, although they didn't know what the Big Bang was at the time. But in, in modern terms, we'd say God caused the Big Bang and then walked off and had some tea somewhere or a beer or what, no, not a beer, sorry, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but uh, went away and whatever's happening now is just the natural result of what was caused by this great causer, God. This was this concept of deism or natural religion. And they call it natural religion because the idea was, hey, if you go to the ocean and you are awed by the majesty there, or you think about how human intellect is so complex, I mean, in our modern day, you could think of it as, you know, it doesn't matter how many 
times people try and come up with a computer system that can make decisions the way humans make decisions, that can walk the way humans walk, that can um, drive the way humans drive in terms of decision making. We don't seem to be able to arrive at a, at a model that actually um, can match the, the incredible ability of humans. And therefore, okay, here's this, this hypothesis or you could come to the conclusion, you don't have to come to the conclusion, but you could come to the conclusion there's, that there's something incredible that created this, this beautiful sunset or this incredible uh, beach or this incredible intellect that humans have that doesn't seem to be as yet capable of being reproduced. Um, that is natural religion, meaning nature proclaims something incredible that, you know, maybe there is something that caused this beauty that's here or this um, uh, creativity that we see. Um, that's what they mean by natural religion. Okay, so from Voltaire, we move on to Denis Diderot, who's a rather bawdy fellow, a lot of dirty jokes, a lot of dirty po poetry. We won't spend too much time on uh, Diderot. Um, Although we must point out the fact that he did, in fact, as your textbooks say, uh, develop this encyclopédie, which is a uh, great, uh, what do you call it, uh, groundbreaking um, opus. This encyclopédie was a collaborative effort to compile and distribute a wide variety of knowledge from an enlightened perspective, and this is the reason why it was ultimately banned. Here they take all the topics that, you, that people would have had questions about, just as your Wikipedia, you get all kinds of questions answered immediately from Wikipedia. They didn't have anything like that back then. Here is all of a sudden, you don't have to be a master, you don't have to know physics to the level that Newton did. You can at least get some level of understanding on all these different topics from Diderot. And so the problem being that each one of the topics that he writes about, he does it from the Enlightenment philosophical perspective, which is decidedly against the traditional powers of the monarchy, against the traditional power of the church, against traditional concepts altogether. And so this is why it gets banned. They don't want this kind of uh, unauthorized thinking to be out there floating around for the public to see and be convinced by. Um, I'm going to skip through this. Um, he does, he does, here's a quote from, from Diderot, and I want you to take a moment to look at your list of four, reason, science, liberty, toleration. Which one of these is Diderot not, <laughs> is not showing with this quote? His hands would plate, meaning braid, his hands would braid the priest's entrails for want of a rope to strangle the king's. He says this at a, a, a drunken party carnival, which is like uh, Mardi Gras. Uh, nevertheless, it was something that he, he wrote in advance, um, making a comment about two different groups of people, which ideas of the Enlightenment is he not illustrating with this quote. He's complaining against the church, he's complaining against monarchy, but he is doing it in a way that is incredibly intolerant. Uh, so you want, this is a good quote to show that philosophers didn't necessarily live according to their own ideals. <clears throat> Context is Carnival. He was also a big prankster. We don't really have time to get into that right now because we're on, you guys don't have a lot of time. So we'll move on to Montesquieu and Rousseau. Uh, you definitely want to know about Montesquieu if you're an American because it is his ideas. Uh, he wrote the book, The Spirit of the Laws. It's on his ideas that we organized our uh, constitution, particularly this idea of the separation of powers uh, between legislative, executive, and judicial branches of our government, the checks and balances system, all of that is based on his philosophy and his observation, the veto of the executive branch. And his observation was similar uh, to those who talked about social contract, uh, Locke and Hobbes both saying that there's this state of nature where people generally act in, in ways that are self-interested, such as jealous for power. And um, so if people are naturally that way, they don't tend to do things out of the goodness of their heart, let's set up government to use that, that selfishness against each other. Here, let's separate them. Let's put them in separate branches so that they can check each other's power. 
And that way we, we use our powers of, um, of observation, right? Empiricism. We use our powers of observation that human beings tend to be self-involved, tend to take care of number one first, themselves first. Let's look at that and acknowledge that that is the way humans behave, and let's build up a system that checks that. Here, we'll put some power-hungry pe people in the legislative branch, and power-hungry people in the executive, and power-hungry people in the judicial branch, and hopefully they'll balance themselves out. You can decide for yourself whether or not that actually uh, is successful or not. That's, that's, that's your call. But that was the ideas that Montesquieu brought to the table that become a part of our Constitution. Okay, and finally, uh, for today, we're going to end with Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, this is my uh, favorite nemesis. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau has some great ideas. He also follows this idea of the social contract. Um, and he, he subscribes to the idea that people have the power uh, to take back power from government. It's a contract with the government. If the government does not do its job, you take that power back. Although he didn't even trust representative governments, such as voting for a president or voting for a representative. His idea was, and maybe rightfully so, you decide for yourself based on your observations. Uh, but he, he claimed, look, only during election season are they actually listening to what you want. As soon as they get into the positions of power, they don't care about you anymore. They're taking care of their own. Um, and so he wasn't really an even, he was more interested in direct democracy, meaning people making all the decisions in government all the time directly, which for, you know, a government of our size is simply untenable. So people considered that part of his, his political philosophy to be a bit too naive. Um, what makes a government legitimate? Uh, it, it, these are the questions that he's asking uh, in the same way that Locke did. Um, he's very famous for this quote. This is one you want to write down. Man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. He, um, he is very much trying to get society to free itself from its traditional values. Free itself from its traditional values about what power the, the king should have. Free itself from its traditional values from what power it believes the church should have. Um, <clears throat> Oops, sorry. Um, so what makes a, a government legitimate, in his, his opinion? It, it's only legitimate when the people give it the power, and the minute it stops doing it, uh, its job, providing uh, natural rights, you pull that power back. Um, now, he, he believes that government must submit to the general will, meaning the power of the people, the, the, the will of the people, the majority of the people, that it, the government must submit to the people's will. Um, and freedom, this is an issue with him. He believes... Rousseau takes a different position from, say, Locke and Montesquieu, who look at the human condition and see humans as naturally, uh, naturally selfish, naturally self-involved. Rousseau's position is, look, the reason people behave poorly is because they're raised incorrectly. If you give them freedom from an early age to make decisions, they're going to make good decisions. If you take tradition away and you allow children to simply grow up in their natural state, then we will have a better progress. Although, uh, if you ask uh, young ladies who've done babysitting what they think about uh, children being naturally good, uh, you might get different answers. I'll, I'll leave that experiment, that empirical experiment, up to you. Uh, now, he writes this book. Now, this is a this is a big this is a big controversial thing. Emile. He writes this book, Emile, or also called On Education. And in this book, if you open up your textbook, uh, I suggest that you do that because we're going to be using that in a moment to look at some, some uh, primary sources. But if you open up your textbook to chapter 17, uh, where they talk about his book, Emile, it's on page 508, um, it says here, written in the form of a novel, the work is really a general treatise on the education of natural man. 
Rousseau's fundamental concern was that education should foster rather than restrict children's natural instincts. Life experiences had shown Rousseau the importance of promptings of the heart and was a, sought to, uh, a, was a balance between heart and mind, sentiment and reason. In fact, he's, he's kind of a precursor of the next movement of romanticism. But other, in other words, bring up a child with the freedom to make decisions and, and, and with gentleness and care, and they will turn out well. The problem with this particular position of his is the fact that, and, and Rousseau, here, here's the thing, uh, Rousseau, excuse me, not Rousseau, Voltaire actually comes to really dislike uh, Rousseau very much. And in their later careers, they, they, they fight with one another by, by letter quite a bit. And in fact, an example of Voltaire not living up to the uh, Enlightenment um, ideals, go back to your list of four, reason, science, liberty, toleration. Voltaire actually calls for uh, Vol um, Rousseau's next book that comes out to be pulled off the shelves. It was uh, something about a mountain. I can't remember the name of the title of the book. Um, but you can you can Google that really quickly if you if you want to know what the specific book was. Um, but his next book that comes out, well, it, actually Voltaire is kind of irritated by this book because this Emile on education because he knows what Rousseau does in his re, in his real life, and you can find that in your textbook um, on page. Um, let's see here, where do they out him on his his. Uh, hypocrisy. Um, I believe it's also between 508 and 509. You can find this in your textbook. I'm not making this crazy thing up. The fact is that Rousseau actually abandoned all of his children. He was fiddling around with his uh, servant girl um, and had five different children with her. And for each one of his children, even though he writes this book, he becomes, becomes this hero in Europe of, of, of great fatherly affection and, and great ideas for e educating children, this paternal, wonderful, loving paternal figure because of what he wrote in Emile, or on education. And yet it turns out that he abandoned each, each time his mistress slash servant, housekeeper, what have you, gave birth to a child, he would required her to take the child to the, the nearest orphanage. Now, if you know anything about orphanages at the time, I don't know if you ever read any uh, Bleak House with, uh, let's say, uh, authors, uh, Charles Dickens, any horrible Charles Dickens books about how the horrors of public housing and orphanages at the time uh, in, in England and France were very similar in this respect. Most children who were sent to orphanages would actually die of neglect, die of malnutrition, die of diseases coming from neglect, cold, not getting the things that they need. And so the idea that he would send all five of his children when they were born to an orphanage, basically put them to death, uh, Voltaire found to be odious, and he actually outed Emile. And so first of all, uh, well, no, we'll come back to that later. So Voltaire pretends that he is a conservative uh, Genevan, conservative Christian Genevan and writes an anonymous letter to the public about um, Rousseau and Rousseau is run out of town basically uh, because but Voltaire specifically asked that they censor his book that is his request that they censor um, Rousseau's book Voltaire is asking for censorship go back to your four uh, words of the Enlightenment reason science liberty toleration does that match liberty? Does that match toleration? You decide for yourself. Nevertheless, you need to keep in mind, here's a counterpoint you can bring up when you're talking about how Rousseau has this great opinion of humankind and, and how much potential they have. He, and what's the best way to raise a child? Keep in mind his personal life. Also, there's this issue of gender roles that we find does not fit um, Enlightenment ideals, and you can find this on page, let's see here, page 511 in your textbook. And one of the things that I want you to uh, do is read both of those passages on page 511 
and then you're going to answer the questions um, in this video in response to that. Keep in mind that this quote up on the screen is a very generous com quote compared to uh, what you find in the reading. If you look here, one of the things that he says over and over again is that man ought to please, excuse me, women is made specially to please men. And that should, and then later on you can see the, the whole education of women ought to relate to men to please men, to be useful to them, to make herself loved and honored by men. Okay, This is Rousseau's position on women. So you need to be aware uh, liberty and toleration extend to only some people in the population, and, and with philosophe certainly does not extend to uh, women or pe people of color, for that matter. Uh, and with that, I uh, will let you stop and do the reading that's required and I will put in Google Classroom what your homework is.